Professional, thank you so much to all of you for um for coming along this evening um to um to hear me talk a bit about um some of the work that I've been doing with um with textiles and you know finding that as a as a new way of um, of telling stories. Um, Yvonne said I, I'm going to talk about two projects. I've been a bit sneaky and snuck in a little bit about um one more project just at the end very briefly um if we have time. Um, and I think the plan is that um there will be time for questions at the end, but also if you want to kind of um, capture questions on the fly, if you like, in the chat box, I think you can you can write them down. But obviously, I'll not be able to I won't be able to read them and respond to them at the, at the time of talking. But hopefully, we can catch up on those um, later on. Um, and I realise I'm sort of like bathed in this glowing light at the moment, but it's just as if my room was getting darker and darker, and I realised I wouldn't be able to to read any of my notes um, if I didn't put some light on. So um, so hence the hence the glow. Um, so, um, as you might have detected, um, I'm not from Milton Keynes. Um, I'm based over in Belfast, and that's where I'm talking to you from tonight. Um, and as many of you will know, um, linen, Irish linen, is a kind of a, a huge feature of um, of our textile culture here in in Ireland, and particularly in the, this part of Ireland. Um, and all of the projects I'm talking about tonight are all made with with linen with Irish linen um it's it's a, a textile that I just think is, is absolutely gorgeous to work with because it's it's the, the, you know the weight and the suppleness of it and um, um the, the, just the lovely kind of hand feel of it um and obviously culturally for anybody growing up in this part of the world um linen is kind of it, it's just kind of in our DNA in many ways it's in the built environment around us it's in street names and place names and many people have got um, you know some kind of family um, connection with the linen industry um, and this is just a little flax flower which is a, is a gorgeous little flower and it's um, and as part of, of part of the dress for Kathleen project I had to go growing linen flax I think I had maybe had some kind of wild ideas that I was going to try and spin it as well but that didn't I, my, my, my harvesting was not particularly successful but one one thing that I found um with the flax flower is that it, it, it lasts such a short amount of time it will it will bloom in the morning and be gone before the day is over so it's a, it is a very kind of the flower itself is a very short life um so i um, as, as Yvonne said, my, my day job, as it were, is as a, as a writer and an academic. Um, but obviously I haven't always been a writer, but I think I probably have always been a maker. Um, and I suppose all of us from childhood, you know, we have that wonderful thing where we play and we make things. But as I, as I got older, I always kind of returned to textiles um, just as a thing I liked working with, whether it was dressmaking or having to go embroidery or knitting or crochet or whatever. But it was always just there as a kind of like a hobby thing in the background. Um, and it never really occurred to me that I could bring together my writing and my textile work. Um, and this really began about five years ago um, with the, the first project that I'm going to talk about um, tonight. Um, so this is Kathleen Hutchinson. Um, she was born in 1925 and she died in 1939, um, just a, a few weeks before her 15th birthday. Uh, and she died as a result of a cycling accident, cycling home from work. Um, and Kathleen was, was my dad's big sister. She, she would have been my aunt um, if, if she had lived. Um, and you know, sometimes you hear people talking about how their family families are great ones for telling stories or kind of, you know, and um, talking about, you know, incidents in the past. Um, and my dad's family are very much not that kind of family. Um, so Kathleen was never really talked about very much. Um, and I'm guessing that's partly just, you know, to do with the you know, the, the, the era that the, the, the family were, were kind of coming from. But also, I think when something is, is a kind of like a terrible trauma, maybe it just can't be talked about because it's it's too difficult. So so growing up, I kind of, you know, was aware because I was a kid, I was interested. My dad was one of 11 children, which just seemed like a ridiculous amount of children. So I was kind of fascinated by that. But, you know, but I knew that two of them had died young. There was a, a baby sister who, who died very young and, and there was Kathleen. Um, but I didn't really think too much more um, about it. Um, and I suppose as, as is often the case, as you get older, sometimes you get more interested in, in your, your family's background. Um, 
and it was it was really then just chatting with my dad, you know, that I found out that Kathleen had in fact worked at a at a at a linen factory. Um, so Kathleen and um, and the rest of the family um, grew up uh, in in this little house. Um, this um, is in in a very rural part of Northern Ireland in County Derry and um, near a town called Kilray. Um, and Kilray has a railway line runs around, runs through it. And my grandfather worked for the railway company and this little house was a, was a gatehouse on the railway line. So the family got this, this house as a sort of perk of the job. So this is where Kathleen was born and where my, my father was born as well. Um, so it's just got three rooms in it um, and um, not, not, not too much in the way of amenities. Um, and that's what it's like now. Um, in, in Northern Ireland, we tend to have, we've, got, we've got quite a lot of land, you know. So when a when a house in the country becomes uh, falls out of use, we don't knock it down and build a new house on top of it. We just kind of let it fall. That's the first fall photo, of the first sea that I've seen. I'm keeping that, even though it's a boring photo. Sorry. Memento time. Sorry. Somebody, somebody talking there. Yvonne, are you still there? I'm still here. I said I heard someone talking, but I'm not right. sure. I don't think they were talking to me. <laughs> okay, I'll assume they were talking to me. Okay. Um, so um, yes, yeah, so this is this is um, this is what remains of the house now. Um, uh, being eaten by trees, I think. Um, now, when Kathleen was 14, she left school and started work at a linen factory. Um, now, growing up in Belfast, I always thought the linen industry was very much kind of Belfast based industry. And I hadn't really realised that actually there were loads and loads of linen mills dotted around um, all over the countryside. And the linen factory that um, Kathleen went to work at was called William Clark and Sons. And they were based in a village called Upperlands, which was about six miles from where Kathleen lived. And um, she cycled to and from work every day um, to get there. Now, this is the office that she, she worked in. I don't know if you can see the date up on the, the top of the drain pipes there, but it was 1929. Um, so um, by the time she started working there in 1939, um, this really only had been 10 years old. And, and you can imagine, I mean, it looks, it's quite sort of, you know, quite stylish really uh, as a building. Um, and I can imagine it probably would have been quite a sort of, um, Quite an exciting thing to go and start working in, in the office in a, in a place um, a place looking like this and so, so much more grand than she was um, used to at home. Um, I mean, uh, my, my dad's family were very kind of like um, ordinary working, rural working class people. Um, and as I understand it, with the kind of all the weird little kind of um, levels of class, um, I think to have got a job working in an office to train to be a typist would probably have been considered quite a kind of step step up from you know from maybe the the, the normal expectations um so I, I i i can imagine this as being quite an exciting time in kathleen's life um now william clark and sons the linen mill they are actually still in operation um but a little bit like with the cottage that's just been allowed to fall down um it's on a, it's on a sort of big kind of rural site so as bits of of the of the um of their premises have kind of gone out of disuse or caught fire because linen mills always seem to be catching fire and um, they just kind of go and build a new bit somewhere else so actually this is um this is still on the um on the kind of the estate if you like of the, the linen company itself and you can go and, and wander around it um as i say kathleen started work here when in 1939 um just in the summer just as the second world war was beginning and of course with the war came the blackout um laws and one of those laws was that the um anybody traveling on a bicycle had to put a shade on their on their bicycle lamp um, and this was really what, what resulted in, in Kathleen's death, um, because a couple of weeks before Christmas in 1939, she was working late um, because things were incredibly busy with the war um, and set off to cycle home. But because her lamp wasn't shining like properly out in front of her, it was just kind of pointing down at the ground. She didn't see a pedestrian walking on the country road in the, in the absolute darkness and she swerved too late and fell from her bike. Um, and, and suffered, I suppose, what now we would call a catastrophic head injury. Um, and she never regained consciousness and she died a couple of days later in hospital. Um, now, my dad was only six when this happened, um, but, you know, he still remembered very vividly, you know, so many kind of elements of the story and, and just talked about the, the 
the complete bleakness, you know, of that that Christmas and that house, which I suppose is is, is very hard to imagine. Um, and this is just the story as it's as it as it was recounted in the local newspaper from the inquest. So as I got to know more about Kathleen's story and realised that the kind of linen was all part of it as well, um, I, I started thinking that I wanted to do something with this story, but somehow it didn't feel right to, to to write it down you know which might be what I would normally do with it with stories I'm not actually I'm never too kind of comfortable with writing um you know sort of life writing or, or, or sort of like um um kind of um autobiography type of thing so um and I didn't want to fictionalize it and then it kind of got to thinking about about a different idea I suppose which was that what if I indulged in a little bit of magical thinking and imagined that Kathleen hadn't died and that she'd lived to be 21 and that for her 21st birthday she got a dress made and I thought right I'll make I'll make the dress for her and sort of try and you know express something about her life through the dress um now I suppose in a kind of in, a, in an artist's perfect world I would have had a dress that Kathleen had owned and could have used that and maybe kind of embellished it or embroidered it or whatever but actually there, there's there's nothing belonging to Kathleen surviving you know only just a couple of photographs um and actually when my, my dad's family they they moved from that little cottage after the war when the council houses were first built and they were they were given a council house and my dad said that they actually piled up pretty much everything they owned outside the house and burnt it um because it was you know, for them, I suppose that all symbolised a, 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 an impoverished past and the future. You know, if you're going up in the world, you get new stuff, you know, so they were moving into a new house with running water and electricity and were buying new furniture. So everything was just everything was destroyed. Um, so it's very kind of like um, drastic, sort of symbolic step to make, I suppose, saying goodbye to that old life. Um, so I kind of had to invent the artefact, uh, invent a dress for Kathleen, I guess. So my starting point was to get a pattern. And I got a, 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 an authentic pattern from about 1946, which is when Kathleen would have turned 21. Um, and I just love this. This is obviously a pattern from, you know, the era of rationing, you know, so you can see like there's absolutely, there's nothing wasted, you know, there's no kind of excessive kind of frills and flounces or whatever. This is kind of really elegant little, little day dress. Um, and I was able to um, actually get some linen from William Clark and Sons where she where she worked. Um, now Clarks no longer make dress linen, which and, and back in the olden days they would have made all sorts of linen. Now they, they don't actually weave the linen themselves, now they finish it. So it's a kind of the you know printing patterns on it and putting surfaces and so on. on. But I was able to get some um, some ivory upholstery linen, in fact, and I used that to make um, make the dress for Kathleen. So the next slide here just shows the the, the finished dress, um, and the, the, I've got a few more slides which will you know will will show you um, some of the detail of of some of the embellishment um, that I did on it. Um, what I wanted to do was kind of a bit of a I suppose it was a bit of a mixed bag. I mean, this is, you need to bear in mind, this is like my first foray into, into textile art, I suppose. So I very much kind of didn't, didn't know what I was doing, but just was sort of following following instinct. Um, so it, it did take quite a long time because as, as any of you who are like practicing as artists will know, you know, there's a lot of, it's just about kind of like trying to sort of really just patiently waiting for the thing to kind of fall into place or the next thing to fall into place and decide what feels right. Um, so that was really the approach I, I took with, with this dress, which kind of caused me a bit of a problem because it was lovely. The Arts Council of Northern Ireland gave me a grant to, to help me work on it, which was brilliant. But um, but Arts Council grants, as you um, will probably know, quite often like of a 12 month kind of date stamp on them. And because it took so long to do this, you know, I was way over the amount of time I was meant to spend making it. Um, so I kind of got into a bit of trouble with the, the Arts Council over that. Um, but that's okay, they're still talking to me, so it's, it's not so bad. So just to give you a little bit more of the kind of detail of um, of what I did with the dress, this is just a close up of the, um, the, the bodice. Um, I, I did a lot of an applique embellishment. I got some um, vintage cotton linen mixed fabric 
of the of the period from about the, the 1930s, 40s. And I, I thought that might be the sort of fabric that, that Kathleen might have had a dress made out of. Um, so I, I cut bits of that out and appliqued it onto the onto the plain linen. Um, and I also got some old family photographs and printed them onto silk and then appliqued them on as well. But in terms of kind of capturing Kathleen's words, what I tried to do was, was to reimagine, you know, her experience of the world. Um, and I was really concerned with this whole project that I didn't want this to be doom laden. You know, this wasn't about this kind of like doomed young girl kind of um, moving towards death. I wanted to actually capture the, the life, the fact that she was full of life. And in many ways, the world was was opening up. You know, she, she, she was away from school. She'd started working at this kind of company, which was supplying linen all over the world. Um, and, um, you know, the, 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 that kind of optimism and okay, the war was started, but wars can be exciting as well, you know, maybe if you don't know too much about them. So it just kind of was trying to capture that energy and excitement. Um, so I started writing fragments of, of my imagined thoughts of Kathleen's. Um, and then to, to embroider them on there, I, I went to a residential workshop run by um, an artist I'm sure some of you will be familiar with called Rosalind Wyatt, who has um, this amazing expertise at, at you know, doing handwriting and stitch um, and the method is is um it's it's not you don't you don't sort of trace the um the writing onto the fabric or anything like that you do it by eye you look at the handwriting and you, you stitch it on but you don't kind of um do like a sort of running stitch kind of thing it's more like a couching um effect so you kind of do the loops because most handwriting is kind of all about loops so you do the loops and you kind of catch up a little bit of couching um so it's it's fascinating to do you have to say for extremely time consuming um and of course I didn't have any examples of Kathleen's handwriting to work with so I had to write write the thoughts out in my own handwriting and then then stitch it on um my I'm sure Kathleen's handwriting would have been much neater than mine because she went to school when people were taught handwriting um but so I st started stitching um her words onto the dress um, the only person in the family actually whose who's handwriting we do have examples of is my grandfather, um, who was a, a, an inveterate keeper of notebooks. Um, so I found a little notebook of his from 1942, where he's noted things that, that he, he bought a pig or he's bought a new pair of boots. And he's great. He it, it was kept, kept note of all his, his hours worked and wages and when he was short on his wages and had to kind of take issue with the train company and things like the, you know, the serial number of his bike and all sorts of random things like this. So I just stitched some of these little kind of random bits from his notebook onto one of the sleeves of Kathleen's dress. Um, and the other document that's stitched on there is um, his one of his war records. He, he actually was a veteran of the Battle of the Somme. Um, so um, uh, sort of had a, a bit of a, a bit of a sort of history there as well, um, and then that's just a, a longer bit of the text from the, the skirt um, of the of the dress um, with Kathleen sort of talking about the. It's quite an impressionistic piece, just talking about you know the colours and the smells of that journey that she was making every day to and from work and I suppose imagining that you know that change that you would see day by day as she was moving from summer into autumn into winter um, on that on that journey um, and then this is just another bit from the, the, the back of the dress which is a, a bit of remembering of her time at, at school I'll just I'll read this little bit out because it sort of got a bit of a, a fabric-y theme to it, I guess, um, which hopefully is, appeals to, to some of you here. Um, the school that, that Kathleen went to was called the Mercer School. Um, Kilray, the town, the nearby town, was like a lot of towns in Northern Ireland was founded by one of these kind of like London guilds. So it was the, sort of the guild, the honourable guild of mercers that, that set Kilray up back in the, whenever it was, the 17 somethings. So the school was founded by them. So the words that are stitched onto this the piece on the back of the dress are, are as follows. The classroom walls were hung with maps, the world, the empire, Northern Ireland. County Derry was folded in a drawer like a tablecloth kept for best. Ordnance survey, Miss Kidd announced, chalking the words on the board, then opened the map across her desk for us to see. I thought it was like a quilt, the dairy line, neat and sturdy as a double seam, running stitch lanes, clustered French knots of trees. 
It was Tilly Moore put that notion in my head. Said when she was first apprenticed to Lizzie O'Fee, her head was full of stitching night and day. She dreamt she was back in the classroom, cutting pattern pieces from those precious maps with her sharpest shears. Imagine a dress made out of the world, she said. And then that's just um, another little bit from the, the back of the skirt where I stitched on a map. So I suppose kind of picking up on the, the map from the um, that little piece there um, with um, using, the old, using the old Ordnance Survey map um, of, of Kilray and the surrounding area with the train line bending around there and the road sort of heading heading south towards Upperlands. And that would have been the road that, that Kathleen was cycling along. Um, so that, that was the Kathleen project and um, it, it, it sparked quite a bit of interest um, locally, I think, and that's, um, you know, it's, it was very kind of touching to me that how much people engaged with the story. Um, I, 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 to be honest, you know, I had more interest in the dress for Kathleen than I've ever had in any book or story or poem I've ever published. So that's quite a sobering thought for a writer, but I think it just shows that actually people do engage much more with, with kind of physical, physical objects and, 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 and the visual. Um, and I know there are lots of lots of visual artists um, you know, in the audience tonight, and I'm sure you'll be, be very aware of that. And I find that when, when the dress was exhibited, you know, people were standing and reading it. Um, and it, because it's on a very human scale, you know, it's just, it's, 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 it's a slight little piece, you know, um, and people seem to be kind of content to, to engage with it. And um, I did feel like putting a sign on it. You, know, you see things on artworks that says, please do not touch. And I want to put a sign on saying, please do touch, you know, because I think, you know, linen's, linen's robust. And I think it's, it's kind of nice if people touch it. Um, so Kathleen, the dress for Kathleen led on to, um, to the next project that I was doing, which was, um, based in the town of Banbridge, which is um, in, also in Northern Ireland. Um, as you may guess, it's, uh, it's on the River Ban, and <laughs> it's got a bridge. Um, but the um, Banbridge back in, in the um, 18th and 19th century was one of the main kind of centers of linen production um, and was an extremely prosperous town. Um, and um, I got involved in a project called Linen Lab, which was, um, set up and funded by the local council and the arts council and so on and the idea was to try and um, engage young people particularly with with linen and you know the history of it and, and, and the, the contemporary uses of it as well um, and they engaged a number of artists and the idea was that we would work on on a piece for exhibition but we would also um, work with schools so I was assigned to a lovely little country school um, where um, they were particularly interested in local history so because I write historical novels and things like that it's it's the, the sort of my various interests were kind of able to, to, um, to kind of collide. Um, so the piece I was working on um, uh, was a triptych of, of three garments, um, uh, embroidered garments. Um, and um, with the Kathleen project, it was very much a labor of love. It took a long time, took a couple of years to make because it was all hand embroidered. So, but with this project, obviously there was a, a very tight deadline. So um, I used machine, free machine embroidery for embroidering the, the writing on the garments. Um, instead. So um, that's just the, the, the artist statement for the, the piece I produced. It was called You Are Here. And um, with a lot of the kind of with things like writing workshops and so on that I do, I'm really interested in site specific work um, and really interested in delving into things like the, um, the census um, and, and finding out the, the sort of the history of kind of the streets and so on um, around a particular place. So my idea with this was it was going to be quite a site specific piece albeit with imagined characters I suppose and that there would be it would be about three young women three teenage girls um one 100 years ago one now and one 100 years in the future and just kind of trying to express the different concerns um of of young women um at these different different times um so um for the the 100 years ago um uh, piece. My inspiration for this was this gorgeous dress, which is in the collection of the VNA. Uh, it's a it's a pink um, Irish linen walking dress or a day dress, sorry, um, from from about 1910. Um, and um, so, luckily for me, the pattern for this is actually available. There's a series of books called Patterns of Fashion, where where um, historical patterns are, are recreated. Um, and um, so I was actually able to. Um, to, to find the pattern for this. So um, I 
um, started working on this dress. Um, you can see in the background there, there's my, my muslin um, toile of the dress because it's a bit, a bit more complicated than contemporary dressmaking patterns, it has to be said. Um, and for the fabric, um, we were very lucky that they're, they're actually in Banbridge, there is um, a, a linen factory that still is weaving linen. Um, and because we were involved in the project, we were able to, to visit it and the creative director just gave us Stacks, stacks and stacks of, of dead stock linen and all sorts of bits and pieces. So I got this lovely, um, lovely bit of um, linen, which I dyed pink um, to use for the dress. And then I um, was embroidering um, the story of this imagined young woman um, uh, onto, the, onto the skirts and, and bodice of it. Um, I, I, was, I was interested in trying to kind of, um, you know, capture how the, the experience of a of a, a young woman at this period from a from a privileged background was in many ways quite quite stultifying, um, and so I was imagining her as as being sort of the, the daughter of of you know people who were involved in, in the linen trade, so very prosperous, um, but also trying to get away from that idea you know that we have of history as kind of it's you know when you drive past like a Victorian house like the grand Victorian house and you think you know how how marvelous and um, sort of sedate and leafy and so on. But I was actually trying to take myself back to a time when when those houses are the new builds, you know, when they're surrounded by, you know, builder shovels and things like that, because her family are kind of upwardly mobile and getting this big house in the country. Um, and I was trying to capture for her, like, actually how boring it must be to be stuck in a nice big house in the country when you've kind of got no agency. Um, and how in many ways she envies the, the, the working woman that she encounters in shops and so on, who, who do at least have some, you know, capacity to, you know, to go out and, and earn some money. Um, so most of the stitching on this dress is kind of um, the, the kind of the rantings and grumbling of a, of a sort of, um, a, a, you know, a, a, a privileged young woman, but, but one for whom, you know, the options in life are probably quite, quite limited. Um, and that's the, um, the dress as it was put together with, as you can see, lots and lots of writing on the skirts. There's a lot of ranting going on. Um, and, um, and as I say, that's really why it had to be free machine embroidery because it would have taken me an awful long time um, to, um, to, to stitch that by hand. Now, I mentioned that I was working on, uh, while I was doing this project with a, with a primary school. Um, and one of the, one of the um, activities that I did with them was I got them to delve into the, the local census returns for, for their own area, a very small area. Um, and it was amazing actually how many surnames were still the, the same. You know, this, this is a village where people don't go too far. Um, and we were able to identify lots of people who worked in the linen trade, you know, as weavers or, or spinners or dressmakers or what have you. Um, so I asked them to kind of like to, to adopt a character and to imagine what this character would say to this privileged young woman if they had that, that choice. And it was great, it turned into like a kind of socialist revolution. Um, so these kids got very, very irate about the injustice um, of the kind of the, the disparity of the, the, the life circumstances of these different characters. So I got them to write their, their words uh, for their characters on pieces of, of linen, uh, just write it in pencil and I actually stitched over the top of it. And what I did was then I, I, I hid these messages in the lining of the, the pink dress so that people could peep under and see the kind of, you know, the, the, the secret story um, but behind the garment. Um, and it was really, it was, it was an interesting project to do with the kids because, you know, I suppose it's for all of us, even the garments that we're wearing now, you know, there's a story, isn't there, behind them of the people who made them, um, people whose names we don't know and don't connect with. So um, it was just that at the time in 1911 or whatever, you know, that, that there was, that those people were closer geographically. Um, than they are now. Um, so in, in, in the spirit of please do touch um, the garments, I was encouraging people at exhibition to kind of peek under the skirts of the, the, the pink dress um, to see these, these hidden messages. And then the, the second garment in the triptych um, was the, the contemporary um, garment. And this was, um, and I don't know if you have this in England, but in Northern Ireland, when kids leave school at kind of the end of sixth form or whatever, they all get leavers hoodies. So they'll get a hoodie with like maybe the, the name of the school on the front. And then on the back, they have the year and like all maybe all the names of the kids in their class on it. Um, it's, it, wasn't, it wasn't a tradition when I was at school, but it seems to have become one um, now. Um, so this is um, this is a leavers hoodie that, that is made up instead of the name of the school. I've got you are here on the front. Um, I just love that phrase. You know, you look at a map and it says you are here. I just that phrase really kind of really tickles me because it's I don't know there's something 
brilliantly grounding about it. Um, and I'm not sure if you can sort of see um, this, but the, the you are here fabric is the same pink fabric as is used in the dress. So there's kind of connection with that. And then on the back, um, we've got the, the year, which was when this was made. Um, but rather than the names of classmates written in here, what I've got is this kind of like um, inner stream of consciousness of um, of the teenage girl who's wearing this. Um, so just like I'll quickly read, read through this. Um, and most of the time, I don't even know who I am. Like I wake up and some days it's okay and I feel okay and I even think I look okay, but then something happens, maybe nothing happens and I just spiral. And you know the way sometimes you go to a party and you're not feeling it and then maybe I start crying and my friends are so nice and all, but some of them are probably thinking I'm a drama queen and they'll be all nice in the group chat, but I know they're probably messaging each other. And of course they are because I do it too when someone else has a meltdown and I feel like I don't exist. Um, so at the time I was making this, I, had a, I, had a, I didn't have a teenage daughter in the house, but I had a teenage son in the house. And um, so the, that kind of just that swirl of anxiety that, that young people seem to live through at the moment. I just kind of wanted to express that um, on, on this garment. Um, and then the final piece in the triptych was set um, 100 years in the future. Um, so being of a negative disposition, of course, I was envisaging a kind of post-apocalyptic um, situation where, where the, the, the climate change chickens have come home to roost and it's, um, things are very difficult. So this is a kind of quasi-military um, uh, uh, jacket. Um, the hoodie and the jacket are both made actually from upcycled vintage tablecloths, Irish linen tablecloths I just got. And, um, and dyed. Um, and as you'll see, there's a little scrap of pink um, fabric just at the top there, which is the same pink fabric. So I suppose I'm envisaging this girl climbing through the rubble of post-apocalyptic um, bridge and maybe finding a little scrap of from that original pink dress and just using it to embellish her jacket. Um, and then on the back, it's, it's embroidered with a kind of, you know, a message from her to, to our generation, you know, um, you know, really in a way furious at us for what we did to the planet um, and what we bequeathed to um, to her generation um, and that's just the, the three garments on display um, at the exhibition. Um, so just very quickly finally and if it's all right Yvonne you can nod or shake your head if I'm all right to go on for another couple of minutes just with these final Final yep, sure. yep. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, this is just a final project, which was um, a community stitching project, um, which um, uh, I um, came up with, I suppose, a couple of years ago. Um, I work for the Open University and one of my colleagues in psychology have been doing a kind of major project looking at the city of Belfast and how communities still keep apart from themselves in Belfast, even though we're now 20 plus years after the Good Friday Agreement. Um, and actually this project team persuaded people to, um, to put trackers on their mobile phones, and then they were able to see where people went according to their kind of community affiliation, if you like. Um, so the pink represents people from a, a Catholic or nationalist background, and the blue is people from a Protestant or, or unionist background. Um, and you can kind of see from this that people are keeping to their own neighborhoods. They're not, you know, there are literally like roads they do not cross, um, and um, which is incredibly kind of sad. But of course, when I saw this, some of these images around this project, my first thought was, oh, that will make a nice quilt pattern. Um, so um, I came up with an idea of, um, of turning this into a quilt pattern and actually trying to bring people together to stitch it together into a quilt. Um, now, I am not um, a quilt maker by any means, but, you know, I had a go. Um, and uh, what I did was I, I put the map through um, one of these website things called Pixel Stitch, you know, where you can kind of pixelate pictures, um, because I wanted to turn it into very simple, just squares um, to work with. And then I broke down the, the, the whole, the overall design into kind of like um, nine, nine square mini squares, so that individuals could kind of work on stitching them together. Um, and I got more of those sort of upcycled tablecloths and sheets and things like that and dyed them and chopped them up into all these little squares. Um, and then we had a, a wonderful event in the Ulster Museum in Belfast where 30 women and girls came together for a Saturday morning um, and started stitching 
um, the quilt together. And we also took kind of pauses where people were able to talk about things like, um, you know, maybe family memories connected with the linen industry or um, just things about, you know, favourite outfits from when they were their children or teenagers. And also reflecting a wee bit on, you know, where they felt they belonged or didn't belong still in the city. Um, so naturally in the course of a morning, we didn't manage to get the entire quilt finished. So I, I had to um, finish the rest of it myself, not by hand, by machine. Um, and then COVID and lockdown hit. So it took a little while, but eventually um, the quilt was completed. Um, and that's the, uh, the complete one there, um, uh, which went off to a, an expert in the long arm quilting and, and was put together. Um, so I'm hoping that maybe when, um, when life returns to some sort of normality that the quilt will be able to you know, actually get out there and, and um, be seen and maybe be a, another way of talking um, about about community and belonging. But I have to say, for, I mean, for any of you, who, I'm sure lots of you do arts workshops and, and, and textile workshops, you know, just that experience of people coming together in a room to work is just so, so beautiful, you know, um, and, and people will talk and share and feel safe um, when they're making things, which I think is the great, um, the great value of it. Um, so that's that's me. Um, I hope I haven't gone on for too long um, and um, uh, I'm happy to, to answer any questions now and I'll try and stop sharing my screen so I can see everybody. Uh, oops, sorry, that was the wrong thing to do. Beg pardon. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Heather. That was really interesting. Um, and there, if you look at the chat, there are some lovely comments in there. <laughs> Great. Um, if anybody has any questions, do please, please fire away. There are a couple of my questions are in the chat also, fairly near the top. Okay. Um, uh, and some others after mine. Uh, the linen mills going back that far. Why do they? Why did they catch fire, Heather? Um, I don't know. They seem to be very prone to catching fire. Um, I, I think. I think maybe the. I, I don't. I suppose there must be a lot of sparks flying with all the machinery going. But um, but I think well, linen is, the process of retting linen is a very wet thing. Yeah, but I think once it, once it's once it's come to the mill, the the, the, the retting days are over. Um, and okay. uh, I, I, it does seem to be. It's funny. I remember as a as a child, you know, when we would go down to Kilray to visit my grandparents. At that stage, they were still retting linen in the fields and the smell is <laughs> something else Awful, yes <laughs> Powerful. Um, and my, my dad does remember like people who were renowned as because they would have referred to the flax as lint. So they talk about somebody pulling lint. Um, and the, so and so was was a great man for pulling lint, you know, so it was a particular skill, obviously. Um, but actually the Clark's caught fire a couple of years ago. Um, I mean, so it's obviously the, the mills, linen mills catching fire is, is still a thing. Um, so in spite of being surrounded by water. Um, we had another question. I did write some of the questions down from the very okay. beginning. Does the name Linen relate to linen? And that was Antonia asked that. Oh, the, the surname? Yes. Uh, yeah. I don't I don't know. Not not, not my area of expertise. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't answer that one. Um well, Emma asked, um, why didn't you want to fictionalise Kathleen's story? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, I think I've always felt um, slightly uneasy about turning um, real experience into fiction. Um, obviously, you know, when you're when you're writing fiction, you, you draw quite a lot on, um, you know, on the emotional reality if you like um uh, but i've i've never been one for kind of writing autobiographical um uh, or semi-autobiographical work uh, and it's only really quite recently that i've kind of like dared to venture into it. I, I, it's it's just and I, I know it's all writers are different and some are really comfortable with it it's just something I, I don't know i've never felt comfortable with i think it's partly because um you know within my my family background you know um Maybe not so much on my dad's side, but on my mum's side, it's they're very they were very keen on privacy, you know, and like sort of not drawing attention to yourself, and, and I think would have been, you know, horrified at the idea of being um, of being fictionalised, you know, because obviously 
with my nature, like if I found that somebody in my family background was a mass murderer, I'd be delighted. I would think it was exciting, but my family would have thought that was really kind of shameful. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's maybe kind of like sensitivity to, you know, the, the fact that it would it, it would cause discomfort um, mm -hmm. within the family. And I found, to be honest, even when I was talking to my dad about Kathleen, um, you know, sometimes he would actually get really upset about it, and I would feel dreadful for kind of dredging it up you know because I think I think sometimes there's a reason why people repress things and it's because it's too hard not to um and um, but having said that when the dress was actually made he was absolutely delighted and and was re reveled in the kind of the sort of there's a bit of media attention and he, he loved that but but uh but just the actual kind of that the digging that has to happen to get there was quite difficult. So I think so it's a rather convoluted, convoluted answer to your question, but I think that's just to do with kind of my discomfort as a writer and that kind of take, taking, being too close to the story that you're telling. I kind of like to put a few layers of fiction between, um, between the story and, and whatever the kind of source is. Um. And there's another uh, question um, for you. Um, has your textile work influenced your writing? Yeah, I think it probably has, you know, um, probably apart from the fact that I don't do as much writing <laughs> as I used to. Um, but I think um, because with, with textiles, you know, you can, you're not having to do this kind of chronological thing. You know, I feel like it's kind of storytelling in three dimensions. Because um, you know, if you think about something, well, 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 either of the two kind of main pieces I was talking about, you know, you you can both literally read the words, but you can also, in that kind of broader sense, be reading the overall artifact and the 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 material that it's made of is also kind of part of the the texture of the story, if you like. And um, so I think it's made me. Um, be a bit become a bit more experimental in my writing so um i'm now much more interested in doing writing that is maybe more fragmentary um and also i've been doing what what we grandly call in the trade multimodal writing so um so writing that's actually incorporating for me that's that's digital so it's on something like instagram um a form of, of writing that is kind of a mixture of you know text and some um visual art and you know just kind of random weird um, digital stuff um, so that it's um, although it kind of like follows a, a chronology it's not like you know as kind of easily interpreted as, as a, an ordinary story so it's probably made me kind of even less commercial than I already was um, but actually I find it really satisfying and, and I just love kind of like it's like getting jigsaws that don't quite work and kind of shaping them together so it has it has affected my writing I think yeah Has anybody else got any other questions they'd like to ask Heather? Yeah, yeah, I, I have a question for you, Heather. Uh, as somebody who writes and is, and is also a calligrapher, uh, a friend recently commented that I don't seem to ever really kind of attempts to merge the two. Mm. Uh, and I, I sat and thought about that. And um, I think for me, I would find a conflict between for me, the writing is very much about the meaning of the words and the content of what's being written. Yeah. Whereas a calligraphy project is is primarily visual. It's yeah. have I made whatever these words are look as as stunning or impressive or impactful as I can. Mm. And I think if I tried to merge the two, I'd, I'd, I get the feeling I would wind up with this conflict of that's what I want to say, but I can't make that look as beautiful as if I said this instead. Yes, yeah, yeah. Have you have you felt a similar conflict between the, the writer and the visual artist? Yeah, I think it's probably kind of a happy conflict, I suppose, in my case. I mean, one of the things that I found fascinating when I was doing the um, the stitching for Kathleen is that, you know, when you actually look start looking at handwriting, you sort of realise, like, this actually makes no sense at all. You know, it, it, it's so far removed from the word that it's mm. meant to be signifying. Um, yeah. And it just, I think it, it's a bit mind blowing because you, you realize like how abstract, you know, in a way writing is compared to what it's actually meant to be saying. Um, so I think that was kind of really interesting to me that, you know, as a kind of like a words person, 
actually realizing that, that that's this is this is extremely peculiar you know when you, when you break it down um and you know i think i i one, one of the notes i made somewhere along the line was you know words mean so much more more to me when i write them stitch by stitch because instead of like you know i'm a quick typist you know so instead of like rattling away you actually it's like being a stonemason you know sort of chiseling <laughs> so I think it, it changes like your relationship with the meaning of the words. Um, it certainly made me think of like, do I really want that very long word? In there? <laughs> um, but um, so I, I think it's just it, for me, kind of like um, moving across kind of different forms. I just find incredibly enriching. I'm not very good at like putting into words why it's enriching, but it just sort of seems to make the thing. Um, much more interesting and you know I, I am trying now to, to do more when I'm when I'm writing say like a draft of a story and um, write it in, in handwriting rather than on the typewriter and my handwriting is appalling and it's really tiring <laughs> to do it um, but just sort of to see well does that does that change things you know um, yes. and um, yes. so I just think I mean as you know yourself like what, any of these things it's just this constant kind of exploration isn't it um, and and that's um, it feels like a whole different register. I mean, I've, like you, I'm I'm a really fast typist. My my first jobs were all basically I was I was a clerical officer. Uh, my dad was a, an office office equipment buyer, so I've had a typewriter since I was five. Oh, look at I, you! I type at about 180 words a minute. Uh, I was trained in proper italic handwriting, which was developed by court clerks in Italy in the 14th mm -hmm. century to hold together at speed. And then I That's do right. stuff like trying to do calligraphy with mm -hmm. a Chinese brush and like one word every five minutes if I'm really, really lucky. And it really does change the whole relationship. It's a whole different register yeah. of yeah. communication. You're still writing that the whole process and the whole of what's going on inside your head is completely different. It's, it's yeah, fascinating. Yeah. yeah, because a word is actually just a picture, isn't it, for yeah. for a thing. Um, yeah. that, Rosalind Wyatt, that, the, the artist I mentioned who, who um, I, I went on the, the residential course with, she actually started as a calligrapher. Um, right. and, and so she, she sort of like, as, as you must do, like absolutely kind of understands the physical structure of you know, of a written word, um, and then is able to kind of break that down and does amazing work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Fascinating. Okay. Um, are there, did, did we pick up all of the questions um, from the chat box, Yvonne, or are there any any other ones? Uh, John, John is waving his hand. Is he, is he, is he? Is yes, he, I'm going to, I'm going to parallel in. Um, yes, it's, um, I may have led a sheltered life, but it's the first time I think a direct connection has been made between stitching and stone masonry. So thank you for that uh, <laughs> eye, eye opening insight. That wasn't the point I was going to make. Um, I think what you've been describing, Heather, have been breathtaking works of art. I mean, they're made all the more interesting because not only you've told us about the story behind them and the, and the significance of the stories, but also you've talked about your technique and, and how you put it together and the sorts of decisions you've made. So, I mean, it seems to me that they are uh, you, you've, you've captured um, really deep and interesting stories, um, incidentally using words, um, in things which are incidentally garments. Um, they're not actually being worn by anybody, or are they? So my question is, uh, do they ever get worn? And do you lament that your garments don't uh, get worn if they don't ever get worn? Uh, I don't think it diminishes them at all but they are purporting to be garments. So one might expect they would sometimes get worn. Um, yeah, they, no, they don't They don't get worn. I think Kathleen's dress probably could be worn by somebody slender enough. Um, uh, but <laughs> the, the, other, the other ones I think um, might, well, some of the, 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 the post-apocalyptic jacket is probably wearable, but the, the lever hoodie is full of pins, so they're a bit uncomfortable, and that the pink dress is certainly held together by uh, by a wing and a prayer, so probably not wearable. But no, it doesn't it doesn't really distress me. Um, that I mean, what what I find fascinating about it is that you know because as somebody who's come like very recently to to visual art, I suppose, is the you know the fact that they that they get deconstructed and folded up and put in a put in a bag and are sitting in an attic uh, in, in my house, you know. So it's like the, the fact that there's there's kind of um, 
their stagecraft, if you like, to um, to display in them. And then they, they once the stagecraft goes away, they become sort of squashed down again. Um, I was, uh, when I'm always following these kind of mad, ambitious ideas for things. And pre-COVID, I had this idea for this huge exhibition I was going to do of all sorts of linen stuff. But it was very much the theme was, please do touch, because I want people to kind of take them and put them on and roll around in them and so on. Um, now, I suspect in a post-COVID world, it might be a while before an art exhibition is actively encouraging all and sundry to kind of roll around in the, the artworks. But um, but yeah, I, 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 would, I would really like the idea of, of art that people could really physically engage with because I think particularly trying to engage you know um you know children and so on or um you know with, with these things actually that which what do you want to do if you see something interesting is touch it you know um so I'm, I'm I'm all for things being touched or worn or whatever um I, I did get that impression from what you were what what you were describing that there was touching and feeling but not actually wearing yeah not so, not it seems not. to me that an occupational hazard for you is that over the decades of your practice, you will build up an unmanageable inventory of unwearable garments. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I suppose I could start working on something that is wearable when I'm sort of cut a dash in Tesco's or whatever, wearing them, wearing one of them. <laughs> it's, in Northern Ireland, people are very what we call past remarkable. So I think you might you might <laughs> you might get the odd comment. Linda's not in; she's from here. Um, if you if you wore them, but um, yeah, but oh well, it's um, I, I I I'm a slow maker, so I won't have too big of an inventory to um to be dealt with. And thanks, John, for that. Thank you very much. Well, I think it's fascinating is is that the. The writing on the outside of the garment is, is representative of somebody who could be wearing it. Um, doesn't have to be you or anyone else, but but you imagine the person within that garment is is saying what is on the garment. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. I, I hadn't actually really thought of it like that, but that's yeah. That's that's absolutely it. It's kind of like their 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 inner life, you know, made. You know, and I think there's also the the historical aspect that you can imagine that once somebody wore that particular style of garment or mm -hmm. historical and historical garment and mm -hmm. and and you imagine that that's their voice um so there are many there are many different sort of communications going on aren't there with, yeah. the, with the garment and the writing which is which is and the way those sort of play into each other and and, and in parallel um and against each other i should imagine is, mm -hmm. is really interesting yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, I suppose in some ways I kind of feel a slight anxiety that, you know, I sort of think like a kind of a proper artist wouldn't feel the need to, to write words on explaining stuff, um, you know, but um, but that's just, I suppose I'm just kind of working in those in those two registers. Um, somebody was asking about that phrase, yes, past remarkable. Yes, that's a Northern Ireland phrase. So. <laughs> I was going to say, am I, am I the only one suddenly thinking of Melania Trump and that jacket? Oh, yes. <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> no, um, well, has anybody else got anything they'd like to, to add or ask? Heather? Uh, Lynn? Oh, Lynn. Hello, Lynn. Um, Lynn was a student of mine many years ago. Oh, hi. <laughs> we, a wee student. No, Heather, I just wanted to ask you, out of the both um, artistic, creative, um, uh, endeavours, which are you most likely to procrastinate um, <laughs> on? Just, just curious. Definitely, the, definitely the writing. Definitely. The writing. <laughs> is, is, is it because is it because it takes more like creative energy and less physical? You know, like the 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 um the sewing and and the textile work is very is quite physical as well. You know, and and maybe is the writing is it because the writing's more like just draining creatively or what what do you think um, I, I think I, I suppose it's not so much the, the reason I procrastinate about writing as the real reason I'm less excited to procrastinate over the the text I mean, actually I'm really good at procrastinating in both to be frank <laughs> um, I'm, I'm skilled, skilled in both mediums um but I think I, I I like the physical engagement when you're dealing with textiles I mean I think with, for writing now particularly you know, it's it's so physically disengaged. You know, you just it's a and um, 
I don't really think humans were kind of meant to do that. You know, I think we're meant to kind of to make and to do and to do stuff with our hands and our hands and our brains kind of working together and kind of engage in, in physical physical objects and physical work. So I find the, the textile work like in many ways hugely more satisfying. I think with writing, that's one of those things. I think Dorothy Parker, somebody said that she didn't like writing, but she liked having written. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, which I think is very true. Whereas the thing is, if you're if you're doing sewing, for example, like it doesn't matter if what you produce is just a load of rubbish. There's been kind of it's the process is enjoyable. I'm doing a, an art course at the moment, an online thing, you know, trying to encourage like regular sketchbook practice. You know, it's kind of making that point. Like it, it can be crap. It doesn't matter. The point is just to be unafraid and just get something done. And I think with, with anything to do with textiles, it's just that, that, that there's that enjoyability of the process, even if there is no outcome, you know, I could happily like crochet and then pull it all out and just crochet again, because it's actually the doing of it. Yeah. It's like, I, I've got so many hats, you know, I don't need any more woolly hats. Um, so, and I've started to understand like, you know, why, why ladies of a certain generation were always knitting jumpers for relatives. It's not that, it's not that they wanted to, like to give jumpers to people. It's just, they wanted to knit you know, and uh, the jumpers were the outcome um, of the, the many relatives were obliged to take them. Um, but, um, Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Thank you, Heather. Thanks, Lynn. Good to see you. Thanks for coming. You too. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> well, um... <laughs> Fantastic. You know my, my crochet is not that good, Emma. You don't want one of my hats, really. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, who's in the, the next hat can be mine. <laughs> well, there was there have been some really lovely um, comments to read in the chat box. Um, if you have a chance, um, yeah, I'll Heather, and and um, and thank you very much for what's been a really really interesting talk. It's um, really fascinating on so many different levels. Um, and thanks very much for for joining us and making this event possible. Um, it's. Uh, it's great, it, and it's been a great collaboration, I think, between textiles and 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 writing, um, and it shows, you know, how we can um, unite the two. In yeah, it's absolutely fascinating, brilliant. Yeah. I, th I think exciting things happen when you bring different disciplines together. Yeah, um, and, um, mm -hmm. and all lovely. The, no more silos. That's all. <laughs> lovely. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, everybody, and thank you, thank you, thank, thank you for asking me along. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, unmute yourselves, everybody. Let's give, give Heather the round of applause she deserves. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> and shall we, we can bring this hive on. I can see you. <laughs> we can bring this, if everyone's happy, we can bring this to a close then. And, and unless, Dave, you had anything else you wanted to say? Um, uh, I was just, sorry, I was just going to ask, might there be a way that I can see the chat? Because obviously I've not a chance to read read through it. I don't know if it just evaporates when we when we leave the meeting or. Uh... Um, I th will it come up on? If we record it, it will it? It won't come up. You can often copy and paste do... it into a text editor. Yeah. Oh, can you? Is that okay? I'm not. I'm not wanting to stalk anybody. I'm just really interested to see what um what people have said. If that's okay. Oh, I'm just, just trying just to. Just don't leave. Just stay and read it. I suppose. Don't okay, leave. Yeah, okay. okay. So don't, don't end leave. the meeting. Go on. Let me read the messages. Yeah. 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 I'm. Um, I'm just. I'm just trying Vonnie, to. Vonnie, you should get several recordings from Zoom. One of which is a text uh, document just with the chat in. All oh, right. Okay. All right. There's three buttons on the bottom right of the, of your text of the chat box, and if you click on that, you can save the chat. Heather. Ah. Right. ah. Everyone can do that actually. If yeah. you uh, yeah. Yeah. As long as everyone's Lovely. happy with that, obviously. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks. I've just I've just copied the chat into a Word document as well, just for belt and braces. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Which, which case that saves that me repeating myself because if you scroll back up to the top, you'll see the link where you can find out about what else we have coming up at Litfest. Mm -hmm. So just just take yourselves there and have a look. Uh, the, the list will be will be growing over the next few days. There were a couple of events which we pretty much nailed down, but we haven't made public yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are three there that we've announced over the last week. So the list is growing. 
Brilliant. Busy. Lovely. <laughs> okay, well, say, speaking from your festival sounds absolutely amazing. You've got some fantastic events. Well, hopefully we'll see you at some of them. Yeah. It'll be a pleasure <laughs> to have you, have you here. Lovely. Thanks very much, okay. everybody. Good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. To a close. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.